every time I sort of got a foot in the door, I just didn't quite agree with the way that charity was being run. Not through any, like not because they were bad people or anything like that. It was just like, that's not what I believe in. That's not what I have seen. And it's not the difference that I want to make. Um, and so um, my sister who had followed uh, my traveling journals and my diaries and bits and pieces like that, she said, well, why don't we team together and create something that's new? Welcome to the Be The Boss podcast. I'm your host, Joe Bruce, and this is the podcast where my guests and I bring to you the very best success stories, guidance, tips, and tricks to help you get your business off the ground and getting results. So if you're an entrepreneur, a business owner, or you'd like to be, then this is the place for you. So without further ado, let's get into it. So welcome to the podcast, Stuart Cole. Um, This week we have uh, Stuart Cole, founder of Selvin and Friends Foundation, which was a a charity which we're going to hear all about today. Um, Stuart's also one of my best friends going back to uh, primary school, it seems. Um, And we still stay in touch uh, to this this very day. So it's a great pleasure to have you on uh, and looking forward to to hearing about uh, the charity that you you set up. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me as well, Joe. Pleasure. Let's jump right in then um, and let's hear about uh, Selvin and Friends. Tell us the sort of the, the backstory and, and how it all got started and, and when that was. So um, growing up, I wanted to be an astronaut. That was what I wanted to be. Um, and all of my career choices were based around engineering. So I uh, did A-levels based towards engineering. I went to university um, and did engineering at university. And then straight away was very, very privileged that I got a job with uh, an engineering company, um, which was, uh, it was a facade engineering. So it's all about buildings and structures, um, very much at the top of their game. And um, I I just very quickly became disillusioned with, oh, this is it. That's, that's the hand I've got. And I, I have to sit behind the desk now for yeah. the rest of time and, and see it through. Um, so a friend and I went out one evening, um, drank too much and booked flights to go traveling. Um, I booked just to go away. Like I thought, well, if this is life, then I need some time just to say, right, okay, let me, you know, be a bit silly, get it out of my hair, then come back. And he came up with the, uh, at the time, crazy idea of volunteering so we went into schools in central america and we volunteered for uh three and a bit months and and just for Uh, some just for some context here um before this trip you were the man that was um you know a sausage was exotic food for you at the time wasn't it sausage sausage was exotic food i didn't eat anything spicy i hated school as well which (laughs) considering i've just said that i'm a teacher is crazy you know, it was, I was there because my friends were there. I didn't enjoy the school experience per se. And I think there's that thing where people say, oh, tell us about that teacher who made a difference. And I'm like, none of them did. <laughs> I'm very much in that camp. It was like, I just had to go. Um, so the idea of volunteering in schools was just so far-fetched. I was like, oh. In Central America as well. Yeah. In Central America, speaking a different language. So anyway, we, we go over there, um, fell in love with it immediately. Uh, it was an incredible eye-opening experience. Um, came home, straight away knew that I didn't want to carry on working in engineering and I wanted to change, uh, be it education or supporting uh, these amazing people who just don't have the privileges that we have. Um, and so that's the, the real start of it. And that was, let's say that was 10 years ago. Yeah. I then started to uh, look at um, charities who I could try and work for. Um, and every time I sort of got a foot in the door, I just didn't quite agree with the way that charity was being run, not through any, like not because they were bad people or anything like that. It was just like, that's not what I believe in. That's not what I have seen. And it's not the difference that I want to make. Um, And so um, my sister who had followed 
uh, my traveling journals and my diaries and bits and pieces like that. She said, well, why don't we team together and create something that's new? Yeah, fantastic. So tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, what are the kind of the things that you saw in Central America that really made you sort of have, like, what, what helped you grow this passion? Why, why was it so important? What were the, what were the things you saw? Um, well, I'll try not to get on the political side of things of life over there because I don't want to sort of, you know, 10 years ago and I don't want to sort of talk mm-hmm. about that. But the, the, the bottom line of it was that the, the schools that we volunteered in were working with uh, a lot of the indigenous people of Central America. Now, over in the countries where we were, uh, education was free, but you had to pay for books and pencils and uniforms And these indigenous people didn't have the money to do that. They are a very, very poor area of the country and a poor part of the world as well. Um, And so I think when, as much as I said, I didn't like school, we were very privileged here that we never had to worry about that. We never had to worry about a pencil or a pen or a rubber or a piece of paper, a textbook. You know, they were just given to us. and It was like, this is your textbook for the year. And we never even sort of gave it a second thought that someone had to pay for that. You just draw all over um, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so, I mean, over there, the, the children, when they were in school, so yeah. some of them had been at work. You know, the school started at eight o'clock in the morning. Some of them had been at work before eight o'clock in the morning. And so this was an escape for them. It was the chance for them to be children still. Um, and for others, it was like this is a chance to change, to change their life. And even now through teaching in England, if I can change one person at the end of my career, it would have been worth it. And that's, that was the mentality I had. And so it was all these resources they need was, was where Selvin and Friends Foundation came in. It was providing the resources for the school so that, the money the school had didn't have to be spent on, on that part of, of daily school life, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. I, I think the uh, countries in the, in, in the West or the developed world, you know, take these things for, for granted. So, so regularly. And um, I remember when you were getting started and hearing about what it is that you, you and uh, Adam were doing out, um, out in Central America. I just thought it was amazing that you were, taking the opportunity to go and even see what it was that they were doing. So to then, for you to then decide that you wanted to get involved and, and continue having an impact uh, through, through Selvin and friends um, was, um, yeah, really, you know, really admirable and really, really impressive that you were um, at that stage going yeah. to get something started. Um, so yeah. yeah. So well done for that. And, you know, you've definitely changed you know, like you've definitely changed lives over there for sure. And, and now through your teaching as well, changing lives on a, on a regular basis when you're, when you're allowed to get into school these days, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. It seems that way. So that's, so that's great. So uh, a good, a good career move from engineering. Who's disappointed you never became a, an astronaut. Um, yeah. Do you know what? It's, it's quite weird because now, now I'm sort of out of it. I mean, the work that I worked on when I was an engineer, I worked on the Olympics over in London. We worked on stadiums. We worked on um, some really important buildings that were built. And at the time, I was just like, and didn't really give it a second thought. And now it's quite nice looking back going, I did that. That's, that's impressive. So it's, I'd say the engineering side is more of a, like, a, like a hobby and an interest as opposed to something that I want to pursue and work in. So... Um, I've never regretted the move since coming back and the changes that we made at, at all. Fantastic. So tell me a little bit more about setting up the foundation then for anyone that's listening, thinking of setting up a charity of their own. Maybe they have a cause that's, you know, dear to their, to their heart and maybe they, maybe this would be an opportunity for them. Let's hear a little bit about the process of setting it up. What are some of the challenges, some of the sort of the, the hurdles and, and, and the journey along the way? Yeah. I mean, um, first of all, you had to create your, your, your declaration of your intent. That is so important because when you go to, to speak to people about your charity, when you go to the banks to talk about your charity, 
they need to see this. What is it that you're setting out to do? What is your statutory guidelines? There was two places we had to take that to. We had to take it to the bank, set up a bank account, and we had to take it to um, HM revenue as well. Um, the revenue part's really, really important with the charity because obviously anything that earns money is going to be taxed, yeah. um, especially over here. Um, so we had to get a tax exemption document. So by having that declaration, that meant that we could apply for that and, and gain that access. We had to do that before we could even set up a bank account. Yeah. So then we had these two documents that were kept. And after that, we had to uh, then go to the bank. And what was quite interesting was when we went to the bank, they gave us all the documentation, they gave us all the forms, and we filled them in. And we sat down to have a meeting back in the days when you could sit down at a table and have meetings. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and they said, right, okay, so you need to make sure you are guaranteeing I, th I think it was at the time ten thousand pounds per year coming in. Um, I can't quite remember. It might have been ten. It might have been eight. But it was definitely a figure that, when you've got no money, to say you have to have that amount to guarantee your charity account was a very daunting prospect. And at and that point, that at that point, did you know where you were going to be getting money from for the charity? No. No, at that point, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't know how we were going to get money. We didn't know who was going to give us the money. Um, so at this point, you, you've just got, you know, your current number is zero. And you think, right, so we've got 12 months from the moment we say go on this account to get it to this figure. Um, we discussed it together and it was just, we couldn't commit to that because the, the offset of it was that if you failed to meet that amount, they closed the account and it could become taxable. So what we had to do was um, we, they, the banks were brilliant. The bank then told us that you could set up an account like a, an account used for sort of like clubs. So like, uh, like a youth team football club, scouts, guides, beavers, mm -hmm. all of those sort of things, which sort of went the other way where it limited your account to a maximum number uh, which you could determine in your meetings so you couldn't go above that number but it didn't have a minimum okay and to start the the organization off that was the best thing that we could do because then we knew that we had the prospect in the future to change accounts should we need yeah. to but initially we we had that right we can start on zero there's no time limit as long as we don't hit this number at the top and you were both um, so still working was, at this point as well, right? So you we were, both, yeah, yeah, this, this was, was a part-time venture. Absolutely. This was only ever done in our, in our free time. Um, my brother-in-law amazingly created a website for us. So that was, you know, all of this idea of then creating a brand, which is quite strange when you're doing a charity that you think I've got to create a brand, yeah. but we did, we had to create this brand that we could then promote to people because going up to someone saying, I've got a charity where where is it where can i see it so that that was also so so crucial because as i get later on to the story that played such a huge part for us um so we we then had our um tax exemption form we had our declaration and we had our bank account the next thing we needed to do was a way of getting the money um now before we could do that we went to just giving we went to BT and we went to Virgin. All three have fundraising pages where people can donate money online. Um, I didn't know this at the time. I think it's come out a lot more that just giving, take a percentage of the money that goes in to obviously keep them going. Hey, so they have their ad then, Absolutely. Yeah. So they have their admin costs. Now, again, when you're on zero, so then have someone taking 30% of nothing, it is straight away you're like, well, it, it was another hurdle that we had to, had to overcome. But we found out about Virgin and Virgin did a no commission, no fee um, wow. um, online account. So we went through them to set up this, this online donation page, um, which I think then involved using PayPal. So we had to create a PayPal account and, I think because of the idea of tax, how many hurdles there are to overcome yeah. with tax. That I guess, is such I guess a, a tax and, 
and also surely regulating against people that are setting up like scam charities. Yeah. Um, there's got to be a, a decent amount of regulation to prevent, prevent that happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, ev- and um, we're, we're not currently uh, functioning as a charity today, which I'll talk about later, yeah. but we still have, I still have all of the paperwork from every single transaction that ever occurred yeah. just in case someone, you know, down the line turns around and goes, you set this up where is it um so we can sort of we've got a a clear paper trail and i think that's also the next thing to do is to keep all your documentation keep it safe keep it secure um either setting up a an online area where you can have all your documents saved or having them as hard copies that is so crucial so you you need to have your story recorded somewhere so if anyone ever looks it's all clear uh, you can't have anything hidden at all. So, so it sounds like then, if you know, if someone's thinking of setting up their own charity, they need to be aware of a substantial amount of certainly in the UK, a substantial amount of sort of um, uh, barriers to that they're going to have they're going to have to work through that and stay organised and um, keep everything documented and um, yeah. in order to I, keep it legit I, and and functioning. Yeah, and also. Um, I guess hindsight's a wonderful thing. I don't think we properly researched all of that before we sort of said, let's do it. Um, I think a bit of naivety on our side. I think it was also a case of, we didn't know how difficult that was going to be. So a lot of the problems we, we encountered, we encountered as we met them. And so we had to problem solve getting past the problem when it presented itself to us. Yeah. And so you said Virgin was a really good place to go to, 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 um, to use their services. Was there yeah. anywhere else that you would recommend people to go to, to get advice on this? Like what was a good source of um, insight for you? Um, well, what we were quite lucky about with um, was the, the organization that, uh, that I volunteered with in Central America. It gave us, a a foot in the door so to speak as well because obviously they knew that what we were doing was going to be something that could support them yeah but we also knew that um it would open up other doors as well so having someone who had an organization set up just gave us a lot of help and i know we've we've got another friend a mutual friend who did something very similar and i think they went through the same route of you get to a certain point where you need help and yeah you can you can read books, you can look online at articles, but I think if you actually speak to someone who knows and has been through it, that was better than anything else. Just to have someone who goes, right, this is how we did it. These are the contacts we have. Yeah. And it's no different to, you know, if, if you're doing housework, you will speak to a friend and say, oh, you know, when you had a plumber in, what was their name? You don't just pick a name out of a hat and go, that will do. Yeah, it, it is word of mouth, and so that was far more powerful than anything else. Yeah, so finding someone that you know that's had a similar journey in a maybe in a similar yeah. context or at least the same country that can give you those referrals that are going to be. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Valuable. Yeah, cool. So, but so then once you had it all set up, then you had the challenge of uh, making some money. What what were the yeah. steps you went about for that? So, um, again. It, you're at this starting point, you're on zero. The only people who know about you are the bank, HMR and your friends and family. Uh, And unfortunately for you guys, that's where we had to go first. We had to go to our friends and our families and, and we had to sort of say, look, this is what we're doing. Um, We set up fundraising activities. We did uh, triathlons, marathons, half marathons, uh, we did swimming galas uh, to to get the ball rolling, so to speak. And what was amazing, and I think because friends and family knew that it was a personal journey, it was something that we'd been through, they would speak to their friends and their family about things. And it, it grew that way. And then suddenly you had people sort of communicating with you and and talking with you uh one thing we have to do in schools is we have to every year sign a a declaration saying we've got no other interest that we're bringing into school so straight away i couldn't take my charity to my school and say 
support this. Yeah. Like when you're not allowed to do that. So that we couldn't go through our school. Um, but just from our friends and family alone, we raised uh, in excess of three thousand pounds, wow. which we thought we'd get five hundred quid. So to turn around and have three thousand pounds in our account was just incredible. Um, so that then gave us the opportunity of going. Well, now we've got the money. How and when do we spend it? So that presented us with the next opportunity, which was to communicate with the schools again through the organization that that i knew um to offer a certain amount to each country per year um they actually operated over seven different countries um the initial aim was to support the three that i'd worked in yeah that was it so straight away we've suddenly gone from three to seven and it was like oh my word this is incredible that this is a possibility um so that the initial money came from friends and family but what we then had as a response, I think, was the bit that just shows how quickly things can take off. Because we then had friends and family contacting us and saying, we, you know, can we offer this service? Can we offer that service? Um, we had a few uh, friends and family who are, who are teachers and are in schools. And because it's not their charity, a lot of schools, which is incredible over here, which is what we do amazingly, I think, is we all club together to support certain charities. And I think Selvin and friends really struck because um, it, it was about children. And so you could go into a primary school, a secondary school and say, look, this is happening somewhere else in the world to children just like you. And it, it was believable. It was real because I had photos. We could, we could share that. Um, it, it just definitely became a very, very different kettle of fish at that moment in time. So we then created something called our uh, From Schools For Schools campaign, uh, where we started contacting schools. And again, this is where the website came in, because all of a sudden we could go into schools and say, look, this is what we're doing. This is what you're supporting. This is what we're trying to do. Um, and so we could slowly get schools on board which we'd gone from, you know, two sets of friends, which is say a maximum of, I don't know, a hundred people, if, you, if you're being honest. Yeah. So then going into schools where, you know, I think we had three schools and each school, I think one school had a thousand people in it. So suddenly you've gone from 100 to a thousand there. All to, and it was just this way of growing this. A thousand families. A thousand families. Yeah. Plus yeah. the staff. Yeah. And, you know, that's three times. So all of a sudden you're just, you're growing and you're expanding. You know, we were, we were living in our beloved Leighton Buzzard back then. Um, and so we'd taken something from, that we'd bought back from Central America in a small, I think 30,000 people live in Leighton Buzzard, if I'm right. 30,000 people town. We had schools all across the country suddenly interested in what we were doing. Um, yeah. And that was just astronomical at that moment in time so so the keys there then um just kind of summarizing all of that would be that personal story that you had in terms of your experience of being over there being able to share with your immediate network what you'd seen what you'd experienced what they needed um combined with then just reaching out and communicating to that immediate network that you had suddenly kind of exploded outwards um and, and gave you the gave you the reach that you needed to 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 get it moving yeah absolutely that that was the moment where uh it, it just blew up for us and this was probably about 18 months down the line for us so the the big thing for us was at this point is we've got we've been operating for 18 months yeah um we're collecting a lot of money what do we do with it so um, the, 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 the organization was always set up as non-profit. So myself, my sister never took a penny from the money that was raised from anyone. So we decided that our summer holiday uh, would be going back to Central America and taking the first wave of money with us to, to buy the resources for the schools. Cash in a briefcase or? Sorry? Cash in a briefcase or? <laughs> no we what we did we we obviously 
we had the account, we'd put the money aside so we could do it that way. But really, we didn't that's have a, it in the briefcase. <laughs> it would have been amazing, like Wolf of Wall Street when he's going yeah. around, he's got the money <laughs> taped to everyone. Um, so we, um, that was incredible for two reasons. Because one, I was going back to something that I truly believed in. But I was taking my sister with me who had read about it and seen pictures, but suddenly it was real. Yeah. And I remember having a conversation and I've always, um, you know me well enough, Joe, that I'm very, very cynical when I want to be and very opinionated. <laughs> and I was always one of those people where when you watch things like Comic Relief and Red Nose Day, I didn't agree with the celebrities going over to these places and going, oh, look at this, give us your money. And because I was like, well, you've got the money, you give it. But when you go to these places, the, the image that is ingrained in your mind and in your memory is, is horrible. It's not nice. So it, it's, it's also amazing at the same time because you realize how lucky you are, but also how amazing people are around the world um, who just, they just get by and they just do what they can. Um, so we, we took the money over, we, we spent a certain amount of money to support schools. The first country was Guatemala. So we took money over, we supported schools in Guatemala. We bought resources for, it was actually two schools in Guatemala. That was textbooks, pencils, pens, teaching equipment. So like whiteboard pens, blackboard chalk, and all of these amazing things. It just took this burden away from the actual school. Um, so that was absolutely incredible. I think they also said they wanted, what was it they wanted? Oh, they wanted to buy a computer. They wanted to buy a computer so the teachers could plan lessons. Yeah. And that was fantastic because it was like, all of a sudden, that's something that I, we never even thought of, like, you know, a computer to buy. So because we'd raised so much so quickly, it was like, yeah, we can do this. Let's really make an intent here and a statement of what we can do. Um, so then when we came back from that trip of supplying the equipment for the schools, when we carried on our From Schools For Schools campaign, we could show them what the money had bought. And that made a big difference nice. because it was real. It wasn't just a crazy person saying, I've been here, look at me. It, or uh, a sister going, my brother did this. All of a sudden it was, this is what we can do. This is what your money can achieve. Um, we made videos over there, which again were as such a powerful tool. We set up a YouTube channel on the back of it, showing what we could do, uh, and it it then just it flourished. Um, it was the foot in the door that we needed, and we I think there was um, two companies from the schools who then took on Selvin as their charity for the year for their company to support. Nice, and all of this was done whilst we were doing our normal jobs and living our daily lives. So it, it was, it was just joyful to see it really was. Did that um, interest sort of corporate interest uh, and sponsorship, if you will, did that uh, make a massive difference or was it still through the network of the schools and the, 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 the schools and the businesses, it, it was lovely because it, it took the burden off us going to friends and family and saying, we need money. Yeah. You know, it was like everyone had played their part. So, um that that was the supportive network we needed the charity ran for 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 how long and what what happened towards the end of the charity so we it's not a sad story um at all um the organization that who i volunteered with the guy who ran it lovely lovely guy um his his aim from day one when he set up his side was that um the schools shouldn't have outsiders as he called himself influencing the schools um he was happy to set the school up he was happy to provide different ideas and different plans to get the school running but ultimately the school was self-sustainable uh in that they didn't need people supporting him because even though the people appreciated it and loved it i think it's the same for anyone no one wants handouts all the time people want to achieve something for themselves um, and remarkably, what he achieved was he, he managed to get um, former pupils to take on teaching qualifications and then work in the school. So the schools wow. were returning back, back to these people, which was, it was like it was theirs then. It, it wasn't something that someone else had brought to them. 
Um, so for us, that was, you know, that was gave us an end game because it was like, okay, that's, if we can support, as I said, initially those three countries during this period, then we've done our bit just to lighten the load, allow the education to continue and the amazing opportunities to continue. Um, it, two, two reasons why Selvin slowed down. Um, it's still there. It's just, we haven't actively been pursuing it is uh, we both started families. And when you've got a career, another job, and you want to start a family, something has to give. Yeah. Um, and that was the, the, the honest answer. And secondly, um, we had supported these seven countries two or three times over. Um, not saying that that was, oh, we've done enough. You could never do enough. But it had done far more than we we ever, and well, how, far more than I imagined it would go on that first day when we go back to zero, like to to create the money that that came in and expanded the way it did. I think it was just, yeah, it it had achieved more so the goals that we set out. I think in total, I think we're talking. Twenty thousand pounds worth of money that came in through the course of wow. the whole the whole time, um, and like I say, we we started off with zero. We thought five hundred pounds was going to be a big ask. Yeah, that's incredible. So it, it it was for something that was a part time venture. It, it blew me away. It blew me away. That's amazing. What what would you say? Um, what, what's been the sort of the lasting impact on you? So as an experience of, of you taking on this, this project, this charity, starting it up, moving it through all the trips, what's the lasting impact that it's had on you? Um, it's a sense of fulfillment that, that we, we achieve something, but not only that, um, I think I mentioned it before when, when we were talking about doing this and I said, um, in the Damned United film. Um, I know it's heavily edited and not true, but there's a bit where Brian Clough says um, he went to Leeds to take over Don Revy, who became the England manager, because he went to a club that had won the league because he wanted to win it and win it better. Yeah. And that was, that was the thing for me, is that I, I wanted to raise the money, I wanted to create something, and I wanted to create it better than all of those companies that I said I, you know, I, I went to see at the beginning and, and didn't quite believe in. And, yeah. and so that, I think, I think I was vindicated at the end that, yeah, I, I did the right thing. I definitely believed in it. And we, we did, we took it as far as a part-time venture. We took it as far as it could go. Any sort of key tips that you would give to anyone? What would be like the, the one sort of golden nugget that you would give to someone that was thinking of starting a charity of some nature? Um, You've just got to believe in it. Whatever it is, even if, if it's a profitable company, if it's a charity, um, as you know, setting up, you know, Parpos on your side, you've got to believe in it. You've got to be 100% committed to what it is that you're doing. If, if you're not committed and you don't believe in it, it you won't get over those hurdles. They're, they're going to come the hurdles, but you have to believe in it and you, you'll overcome them. Fantastic. And, um, what's the the future then you said uh Selvin and friends still exist do you think there's any possible future uh sort of re um any new beginnings for it later on any years down the line I, yeah i definitely think in the future we can pick it up and move it somewhere else you know it's it's not a case of saying well they're done but i think you know that the world's a big place and yeah. we tackled such I know we said seven countries is amazing. That's such a small part of the world that we looked at. You know, there's other places we could go to. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe one day it'll be a um, great education for your kids to to see it all get started up again. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's something that they, you know, it's, um, my 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 daughter looks at the photos from from before and she's like, "What's that? What's that? What's that?" So there's an inquisitive nature there. So. Um, yeah, definitely something that I think it's, it's the same with any, any you know, charities all over the world. Charities always will have a place, um, rightly or wrongly, they will always have a place, you know, and 
it it takes the goodwill of people and it takes that that like i said that belief that that you can make a change well Stuart, um it's been great talking to you about this uh, it's again fantastic to hear everything that you've that you've done i know i've heard a lot of these stories before but it's great to really get the opportunity to sit down and just um sort of hear the whole thing um not a problem uh, thank you for having experiences me. so um well done again for everything that you've achieved um and, and everyone that you you worked with to achieve all that so congratulations for that um again yeah thank you for coming on and sharing your your experiences for the for the people listening and i guess i will see you in the next zoom quiz that we'll probably be having <laughs> absolutely yeah and, and ho- ho- hopefully in the flesh at some point uh, later in the year as well definitely true cool all right Stuart, thanks so much all right take care mate stay safe Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Be The Boss podcast. I hope you really enjoyed it. And if you did, then please don't forget to leave a like or share it with someone that you think would find it useful. And also, if you have any questions, suggestions, or uh, anything that you'd like me to cover in future episodes, then please do uh, drop a comment or send me a message so that I can do that for you. Thank you so much, and I will be with you in the next episode.